I tend to maybe leave a little bit of extra time before the last song on an album. Or if there's a song that's like a really slow song, you can leave a little bit of extra time. And then I have other times there are artists who will have extremely specific notes, which can be a little tricky to kind of type and translate via text. But then often what they'll do is send like an MP3 of the entire album. And then, you know, I'll kind of, or my assistant will lay things over exactly how they see it, you know, and then I'll put the index points. And that's another thing that gets a little tricky is like, where does the song change versus where does the actual track change? There are two different kind of designations there. Hey everyone, welcome back to The Record Process. This week, we invite Mike Collegian of Rogue Planet Mastering to join us for a more freeform conversation. He shares insights about his journey as an audio professional that eventually led him to focusing on the mastering phase of making records. We took this opportunity to have Mike walk our listeners through the often mysterious process that makes mastering so crucial to finalizing an album. We juxtapose the workflow and tactical approach behind his work on two very different projects. The first being an upcoming album from LA-based rock band Ways Away. The second project being the official soundtrack to the Bob's Burgers movie, which was released on May 27th of this year via Hollywood Records. It was an amazing look at how Mike views the art of mastering and how he has ultimately set up his studio to embrace the joy of listening to music on both a professional and personal level. So let's dive right in after a quick word about our friends at Audio Movers and DistroKid. When the world shut down in 2020, musicians and producers everywhere were forced to re-examine and reimagine their creative process. Without the possibility of in-person studio collaboration, the future of music production was anything but certain. But as the old saying goes, where there's a will, there's a way. And for those professionals who were determined to never compromise on the quality of their audio, the world-class engineers at Audio Movers established that way. By combining the HD streaming of lossless multi-channel audio straight from your DAW with the unique ability to adjust latency and bitrate, Listen To stands as the solution to unlocking global creativity in music production. Its power has been felt on Grammy award-winning albums and on over 85% of all modern Abbey Road studio sessions. So stop letting your physical location dictate the quality of your work and the projects within your reach. For a free trial, just follow the link in our show notes and use the code PROCESS to receive 10% off the first year of your membership. Listen, if you're an artist or musician still struggling to find a better way to distribute and promote your music and you haven't checked out DistroKid yet, then that needs to jump straight to the top of your to-do list. We are proud to have them back with us for another season of the record process, primarily because they, just like us, are committed to empowering and supporting independent artists like you. DistroKid is by far the most affordable service for distributing your music to all digital streaming platforms, and it comes with a bunch of tools to help you elevate your career in a ton of crucial ways. DistroKid not only allows you to spread your music across the streaming ecosystem, regardless of what platform might be top of your focus right now, but it also helps you share your story with labels using their unique upstream tool. You can engage with your fan base using DistroKid's text messaging feature, and they'll even help you create unique lyric videos that can help you promote your music better online. As a record process listener, you can get 30% off of your first year's membership just by heading to the show notes and signing up using our affiliate link there. And remember, we always love hearing what you're working on and how tools like DistroKid are helping you create some incredible moments for your fan base. So please don't hesitate to share them with us. And now here's our interview. Mike Collegian, welcome to The Record Process. We're so happy to have you, uh, Mike, from Rogue Planet Mastering, mastering engineer extraordinaire, amongst many other things. Thanks for being here, buddy. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Yeah, we're going to have some fun. It's going to be a laid back episode. Uh, it is a Friday and there's there's a nice Friday vibe to the air. Um, I know you've been grinding a lot, getting ready to take some time to reset and focus on some um, some deep like business stuff, studio stuff. We're going to get into some of that, too, because it's all very exciting. And um, we, were, we were chatting about this a little bit beforehand. So I'm 
I'm excited for you to unpack some of that for us. But before we get into all that, we wanted to have you first kind of unpack the dark art of mastering, because this is actually the first episode where we've had someone that has um, comes from a uh, point in the process where they are very hands on at that stage and can kind of uh, illuminate some of that part of the process, so to speak. And uh, I'd love to start with just maybe uh, explain a little bit of how you uh, how you kind of got into focusing so heavily on mastering. Sure. Yeah. Um, Well, I mean, I think I kind of took the same path as a lot of people who are in the production in, you know, uh, that kind of end of the industry, you know, grew up as a musician, playing in bands, writing songs, recording my own songs, and eventually kind of got to the point where I was just doing production, you know, everything, uh, mixing, mastering, even though at the time I really had no idea what it was. I kind of had the mindset at that level that it was like, well, I mean, what's the worst that's going to happen? If somebody asks me to master their album, I'm just going to say, yeah, and I'm going to do it. And if it comes out terrible, then we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. Unfortunately, it, you know, it came, it came out all right, but I, I always really enjoyed listening to music and I enjoyed focusing on the sound of music. Uh, I, I grew up, my, my father was a big music fan. He was uh, an electronics technician, so he always had really nice speakers. There were always different speakers and different equalizers and really kind of like, you know, high end stuff and some junky stuff. And and he would have stuff in his shop that was broken. And and I would just kind of listen to how music could be presented in, in different ways. And and I remember when I was uh, uh, when I was young, I had a, a, a stereo in my room and I would hook up different kinds of speakers and mix subwoofers with the speakers and, and, and all this kind of stuff and, and just hear how the same piece of music could hit you in a different way if it was too bright or too dark. Um, So that was kind of always in the back of my mind. And I think because of it and because of my personality, some of the things that make me good at mastering made me not so good at producing. I was a little bit too focused on the technical and perfection and, you know, the, the, and and not enough on like the vibe, you know, sometimes or in a certain way that I think is required for a really great producer or songwriter. Um, you know, I had some success doing that and I feel like I was a pretty good engineer. But when mastering was the one thing that I felt like I could really do well, whereas with production and engineering, there were uh, people all around me who were just doing it so much better than I was. You know what I mean? It was just like obvious. Like, man, these guys just have a knack for like making something that just is, you know, not just sounds great, but is is great. And and then that's one of the things about mastering. I mean, I, I make songs sound great, but generally speaking, they're either good or bad by the time they get to me. Right. So that's kind of been sussed out. And, and I don't think I paid enough attention to that in hindsight, uh, when I was doing production. So uh, I kind of just had this reckoning. I think it was around the time that I had children. And I was like, man, I'm, I'm just not really, I'm kind of treading water with the whole production thing. Uh, but this mastering thing, I, 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 you know, I would send stuff out to different mastering engineers and get work back and kind of went through the different levels of mastering engineers from the budget to the mid to the top. And a lot of times I felt like, you know, I think I could, I could do this. I could, I could turn my mix into what they've turned my mix into. So I, you know, maybe I can do this for other people without going too much on a tangent. I, I, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Avantone, the company Avantone. They make those mix cubes and they make different microphones. Uh, a good friend of mine owns yep. that company. He had recently acquired it, and he gave me this uh, the opportunity to do this really great gig QCing all their microphones because they're made in China, but they're quality controlled in um in the united states so that was kind of this like supplemental income that allowed me to take the jump and say okay i'm not going to do production anymore i'm going to sell all my microphones and it's funny because i'm talking on this road podcast here that the <laughs> urm guys got me yeah it's the yep. only micro it's the only microphone i own anymore <laughs> i i will send you a photo of like a picnic table where you can't even see the picnic table because it's covered in a pile of microphones at one point i had so many and just like so many guitar you know i mean the stuff that you have when you make records yeah i sold it all i literally sold everything except for like my computer and i bought new speakers and i rearranged my room i knocked my vocal booth down and kind of just went full on into it. I, I, I mean, maybe it was a little reckless, but 
it's kind of paid off. I mean, it's really paid off because I'm so much happier doing this. I feel like I'm so much better. And that was kind of the moment where my career kind of shifted and changed directions. And it was, it was apparent pretty quickly that I was doing what I'm supposed to be doing, you know, whereas with the production, it was like eh, a little murky. What an awesome like origin story. Thank you for that. That was so of well course. articulated. Yeah. And uh, I mean, as it always does, I think uh, sheds light on a lot of really interesting insights for our listener, but also some things that uh, some questions too, um, sure. which we always seem to dredge up on this. The first of which uh, I'm curious, which parts of spending time in that uh, the production driver seat right where you're where you're trying to take care of a whole lot of different aspects of it you know the song building it from the ground up the arrangement you know the tracking capturing all that how do you think that shaped the way you see things sonically and do you think that that kind of informs do you think you needed that and that helped you get to that point as a mastering engineer or do you do you think it was more of just like a taste and a, a refining your ear um you know that helped you kind of realize that leaning into that nuanced part of the process was uh, was the right thing to do. No, I think it helped a lot because e even though I don't do um, a ton of like stem mastering, I generally stick to stereo mastering. I think it helps me kind of speak the language mm. a lot of times and I can hear if there's something wrong with a mix rather than just being like, well, listen, this is what I'm hearing. I can, can kind of often guess at what's going on a little bit better because I, I've gone through that process. I, I, I can, man, I was really good at editing vocals and quantizing drums and I, like I've done all that. So, and, and then, and then, uh, speaking to that, I'm also appreciative of the insane amount of time that goes into making a really good sounding song, let alone an album. Whereas for me, it's maybe a day or a day and a half that I spend working on an album. And I really want to make sure that I don't do a disservice to somebody's month in in my you know 15 hours of mastering um so i i think that that's you know i i appreciate um the amount of effort that that goes into it um and then and then maybe the third thing is that i also understand how people who are mixing mixers or engineers can sometimes lose that zoom out you know focus and i, and I hear a lot of people talk about mastering like it's zooming in really far and in some ways it is because we're making these tiny eq moves but it's also kind of like maybe even more so zooming out you know what i mean it's like tasting the soup and just deciding whether or not people are going to like this not like you know oh the, the celery is stale it's like no, no no like just when people you almost have to kind of listen to it like a listener listens to it they don't really always they're not listening to the snare drum they're not listening to the guitar they're not you know they're listening to the song um, so that I, I know firsthand can be sometimes impossible to do when you have crafted that snare drum sound, you know, and, and, and like it's, you know, exactly what's happening every time it gets hit and it's going through a signal chain. To me, it's almost kind of like ignorance is bliss. And I think that the further away I've gotten from actually mixing something, because there was a time where I was like, I could do both, you know, I you give me a song to mix and I'll mix it now. Pfft, no way. It would be a disaster. But I think the further I get away from that, the better I am at mastering because I, I really have to be able to straddle those two worlds between the person who's like finicking over the, the bass tone and then the person who just wants to like turn it up in their car and have it like slap. You know totally. what I mean? Like right. the, those the, those two are equally valid, I think. Yeah. You know? Dude, That what a great point. What you kind of said, it actually uh, rings to, I think, something that I was uh, – mentioning the other day and kind of getting back to the idea of just being a fan. You get to be a fan of the music as you work on it, which is sometimes really hard if you've been in the trenches and and lost all kinds of objectivity because you know every little transient and little thing you've tried to hide or tried to fix or tried to, you know, shape. You can just sit back and say, do I love do I love listening to this as a fan? And you can get yeah. back to to that whole kind of thing that is how you kind of got into it in the first place. You know, you mentioned like pulling different speakers out, seeing how stuff sounds. Um, it allows you to listen without <laughs> without doing that, um, but also speak to something if there is an issue, which I do want to get into um, a little bit as well. And you mentioned there, you know, 
there's some relationships that you have with producers that you work with on a, you know, on somewhat of a consistent basis. Um, so you probably have a, a bit of a language and a bit of an understanding across time and releases for what they might be looking for, right? How their mixes come in and, you know, wh- how you approach them, right? You know, obviously you're listening first, but um, I'm curious, and, and you mentioned uh, actually a, um, a Ways Away record that um, yeah. that you worked on. So I think that might be a really cool example. Um, I'd love to set the scene and tell the story about this record um, to ma- maybe talk and, and speak to some of your relationship and that what it looks like for a producer to hand something off to you as the finisher, so to speak, as the as the, you know, the fan test as it is. Sure, sure. Well, I, do you, do you want to hear? I mean, Bo, who did the Ways Away story, uh, Ways Away record, rather, uh, uh, he's one of my kind of longest standing clients and he's an amazing mixer and an awesome dude. Um, and uh, we've gotten to hang out at some of the URM summits and and we're both dads and he's, a, he does a little bit of mountain biking. I'm a frantic cyclist. And uh, so we, we have a lot in common and we get along. Um, but the, the, the ways away record was a record that he did pretty recently. And, and I've worked on enough with him that I kind of, get what what works with his mixes and it's not necessarily what he wants i mean i think it's a combination of it's what what he likes and then what the artist likes because within one any one producer you kind of have to you know know what the it's how can i word this best it's almost like there's this venn diagram of like what you think sounds good what the artist thinks sounds good what the producer thinks sounds good and like what fits for that type of genre of music because inevitably the song is going to be played on a playlist with other you know kind of genre adjacent music and you want it to hold up so if you can kind of like put your master right in the middle of all those things you're in a good place um having a long-standing relationship with someone like Bo or any other producer kind of helps because it makes that one part of the Venn diagram a little easier to nail down, you know, like I know what he's going to like, I know what he's not, I I know what works with his, his mixes. Um, But yeah, that was a record that I, I, uh, they have a single out for it now. And the previous record I did not master, um, but it was just an album that I love and my wife loved. And we discovered it because I think they did a cover of a beach house song and my wife loves beach house Mm. and she found she's like this this band they're kind of like a punk rock band they did a beach house cover you got to check this record out and i was listening to it this is amazing and then i said oh bo did this album and i sent him a text and i was like look if they come back and do another record i have to do this record no matter what i mean i'll hook them up we'll make it work um but they're they're such a great band and the new record is so good um, and so it's cool in that sense too, to have that kind of communication with a producer. And, and, you know, I think there's also kind of a balance of, of him knowing that I'll do right by his work and do it pretty quick and make him look good. But at the same time, if I don't, he can be like, Hey, look, like you kind of screwed this one up. Like, let's, you know, change this or like, Hey, I like it, but let's do something different. And I'm not going to be like, well, wait, hold on a second. Because I get that. It's like, my the the circle of the venn diagram that includes me is the least is the smallest circle totally. i mean it really i i'm here to advise and suggest but if you tell me that you want something brighter it, it's ultimately your call you know i'll say hey look i don't know if that's you know you're this is check out these other albums that you like and then listen to your really bright master and this is what you're gonna get but uh, but hey, if you want that, then you want that, you know. So so having that really good communication is 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 cool, and I definitely have that with guys like him that I've worked with for a while. What was so like? Uh, I want to like dive into like the process on that record. Was there any moment or like any songs on that record that uh, came up that like the the Venn diagram where you fit in, like. Uh, was a little bit more skewed uh, than where uh, Bo and where the artist liked, and like, uh, and it resulted in something that like maybe wasn't your first instinct, but something equally as cool. On that particular record, I don't think so. I mean, I think that like sometimes 
I, I work on something and I, I get, um, I just get a really good feeling about mm. it. You know what I mean? I'm just like, Oh, this is just, this is just sounding great. I mean, there's, there's like situations where, you know, when I'm working on something and I'm making some EQ moves and it just kind of fits everything. And, and, and that's when you get a really good feeling about where you're headed with an album, because, you know, you, you'll sometimes you'll make these EQ changes and it'll sound really good. And I'll kind of focus on different parts of the song at different times. And, and then you get to another part of the song or another song on the album and you're like, Oh, that just doesn't work. And you've kind of shifted it in a tonally in a direction that was maybe a little bit different than the, producer or the mixer intended so certain elements of that mix don't fit into that kind of sonic space like a perfect example would be if there's a really dark record and you're like okay this record needs to be brighter and you make it bright and it sounds good but then as soon as that hi-hat hits you're like wow okay hold on a second i can't have this that bright yeah. you know i have to do something about this or like the vocal is really bright and the music is really dark and you have to find that balance um with this record it was the opposite of that it was like oh i'm gonna i, I it'd be hard for me to remember the exact moves because yeah, I, I couldn't tell you the moves i made on an album i did earlier today yeah. but it you know a lot of it is in, instinctual um but i know on that album once it started sounding good it was like oh this this really sounds good and then like you know the last chorus comes up which i you know, I'll EQ the song and I'll have it EQ'd by the time the last chorus comes up, but I haven't actually heard it. And then it hits and you're like, oh yeah, like, this is great. Like, I don't have to like reel anything back in. And, um, so, so that was a, you know, there, there are moments that are the opposite of that, but on that particular record, it was kind of, again, I think a product of him being so consistent mm -hmm. and so good as a mixer and working together so many times that like, I, I kind of also know that when I get the song sounding good there's usually not some sort of like curveball coming totally. you know because because we're listening in a, in a similar kind of space yeah you know yeah dude the hi-hat thing was it was awesome i just have to like in, in that that's such a great example too where you're like in terms of like little arrangement changes you're like yeah no this definitely oh no that's yeah. way out of bat you know and it's and it's it's interesting too because yeah it's like maybe you're listening on a different you know a different system and that's part of the reason why we talk about um you know having someone as that like last final um handoff of the baton with that objectivity to be like, hey, listen, I'm just like broad strokes listening now. And that hi-hat jumps out of nowhere when I try to bring this track where it should kind of be. So that also makes me think, uh, were there any examples you mentioned like on the flip side of it where um, maybe it's not this record, but where what does it look like if you have to go back? Because I know there have been times I've worked with mastering engineers where, for example, they're like, hey, man, like I'd love to like kind of really hit this hard. But the snares just get it's just disappearing. It can give me like one more like snare up a DB things like things like that. And the hi hat's an interesting example because that that kind of tends to maybe. Um, at what point do you know? Hey, I I'd, I'd like to go back to the mix engineer and see if we can work together to sort something out because I think that's interesting. Everybody's always like, nah. Once the mastering guy's got it, it's done. But it's not, it, that's not necessarily true because someone like you wants the best result for you know the client and the band. Yeah, sure. It it, it doesn't it doesn't have to be done. Um, I mean, there is definitely like a, a, a value to like I try to make it work whenever I can. Um, but I I also will sometimes say like you know I I I think like here here's my my best master on this song and I'll send it back and I'll say hey you know but I think that if we turn the kick drum up a little bit and the bass down a little bit or you know vice versa or something like that then we could maybe do it better what do you think I usually try to err on this that side of the approach rather than going back like listening to the song and being like oh no, no, no I'm not gonna do this because a lot of times it, it, it can't I don't really know until I start working on it. There are certain times, you know, I mentioned the hi-hat thing. There are certain times where I can just fix that and it sounds like it was never even a problem. And that's generally the goal with stuff like that. If if there's something that like, you know, it's, it's a war, I want to remove it and have it be like it was never there. I don't want it to sound like I went in and ducked that hi-hat out or, or whatever um so sometimes i can do that and then sometimes i can't sometimes the drums are too loud and i can kind of tuck them in in a way where it seems like they didn't need it but i i don't know until i start 
doing of it. Course, and a yeah. lot of times it isn't really obvious when I'm listening to it, even in, in my room. Um, so when it doesn't work, generally I've gotten it as good as I think I can get it without it working. So I'll share that with the, with the artist or the producer or, or whatever and say, Hey, like it sounds pretty good, but what would you think about doing this? And usually they're pretty receptive if I do it that way, or they'll say, Hey, no, I think this sounds great. Like this is what we're going for. And if that's what they're going for, then it's, then it's cool. But yeah, I mean, it, it kind of goes, it kind of goes both ways. I, I try to be prepared for whatever. Yeah. Taking a minute here to shout out our good friends at Sheet Happens Publishing. Back with us again for season three. They are a company that works directly with artists to create accurate and immersive tab books, vinyl, and other merch that allows fans to get one step closer to perfecting the soundtrack of their lives. As many of you may know, I had the pleasure of working side by side with them to put together a book for my band, The Wonder Years. And believe me, they are incredibly thorough and always dedicated to artist approved accuracy in every one of their books. Every tab book comes with the accompanying guitar profiles, which allow you to jump right into playing along with all of your favorite tracks. So all you need to do is head over to SheetHappensPublishing.com to check out everything they have to offer and be sure to enter the code TRP15 at checkout for 15% off your first purchase. Or you can find the link in our show notes. And again, that's promo code TRP15. I feel like it's often overlooked, uh, at least uh, initially on like the artist side. But I feel feel like it's very important to you. But uh, like sequencing and the song spacing, could you talk like about that on that on this like uh, ways away record? Like as far as like were they like highly specific about like oh this has to be a, a two second breath right here and then like it goes into this or like i don't know if they really were i mean it's one of the things is you look at the type of record it Mm -hmm. is right and that's kind of like a a louder rock record so generally in that sense and it is something i pay a lot of of attention to you know how the songs start how they end what the spacing is between the songs i think it's it's really important to do all that and i address it with every song um i i master uh, also, you know, making sure that there's enough space. So some streaming services do that little fade up at the beginning. I, I don't know mm-hmm. who does. I remember back in the day, my old CD player in my car used mm-hmm. to do it. Uh, so <laughs> so I've, I've gotten into the habit of leaving a very uniform amount of time in front of every song unless I have to kind of work with a gapless thing. But with them, so I said, OK, you know, this is kind of like a more of a punk record. Like I'm going to kind of really have each song on top of each song other songs um, or other albums rather and other genres I'll spread it out more and kind of just like listening through the album and and feeling out you know I tend to maybe leave a little bit of extra time before the last song on an album or if there's a song that's like a really slow song you leave a little bit of extra time and then I have other times there are artists who will have extremely specific notes which can be a little tricky to kind of type and translate via text but then often what they'll do is send like an mp3 of the entire mm, album and right. then you know i'll kind of or my assistant will lay things over exactly how they see it you know and then i'll put the index points and that's another thing that gets a little tricky is like where does the song change versus where does the actual track totally change? there are two totally. different kind of designations there um so it, it, yeah and then where do you, you know, when you're going to CD, without getting too techy, there's uh, almost like a, a grid that you have to kind of, you can't just slice a song anywhere. You have to slice it on a frame that works for a, a CD or else you'll get a clip. You have to kind of put it on a, in the right space or it's going to sound weird when it goes on streaming. So there's all these kind of considerations. A lot of times artists will have very specific requests of how their album's going to flow, but they're not really taking that stuff into account. So I kind of have to translate that mm. into the mold of, of what's going to work. Um, and it, it can get a little tricky. Uh, one of the things that really helps me is that I have a, a service that I use to deliver files that will play gapless, mm. you know? So I know that when I send, and that's been a huge thing for me over the last couple of years is switching over to that. Cause I used to just send links through Dropbox and you could download it and put it in iTunes. And, and then the problem with iTunes is if you don't, play enough of the previous song it takes a second to load up the next song and then people will say hey why you know uh, the drummer is saying that there's no gap between the song i'm hearing a gap so this this kind of solved that and everybody hears the same thing you can stream it on your phone you can stream it on your computer 
um, uh, hear, it, hear it right. Sa- Sampley, right? I, Sampley, I can picture yeah. the portfolio of, of getting stuff back from you. But yeah, because I actually did look into that too um, because I really it's a really nice client experience coming from a client of yeah. yours um, yeah, yeah. in the past. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that actually because it is really effective. And for that reason too, especially when it comes to sequencing of whole things, yeah, like you really need to have that and make sure that there's no like weird random settings on whatever, you know, you can't just like throw them up on SoundCloud or in like an, a, you know, an Apple playlist and send them to someone, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Or accidentally have your iTunes EQ on. And I've gone through like rounds of revisions with, <laughs> with people who have just been like, you know, it's too bassy. Like, how could that be? I'm listening to it. You know, sometimes you get to a point where you're like, let's jump on the phone. Like I just, something's got to be off here or it's too quiet or, you know, so this is like full volume, no EQ. I know that they're listening to it the right way. It's super easy to use. Um, and, and, and I, I really love it. I don't want to sound like I'm plugging them. I, I, I pay for it just like anybody yeah. else, but they've been such a cool company to work with. Um, they've, uh, I gathered that they're kind of small because they respond like super fast. And the guy who, who runs it is, is super receptive to, you know, different feature requests. And even in the last I don't know, maybe it's been a year and a half or two years since I started using it. It's already gotten so much more streamlined and to the point where I was concerned that it would be slower than Dropbox, but now it's like so much quicker to deliver files that way. And and it's, uh, it's really any little thing that can make my job a little bit faster. That's not part of the actual mastering. I'm all about it because and we talked about this a little bit on the phone, one of the things about mastering that I quickly realized when I started doing it full time versus producing is that the repetition and the the client interaction and the project management and the amount of files that you deal with just it's orders of magnitude greater than production. So while naming a file might not be that big of a deal when you're mixing a song, like having to name every file of every master you send out is a full time job. Yeah. You know? So it, like you have to figure out a way for it to be either automated or delegated or, or, or something like that. So little workflow enhancements like Sampley that that make my job easier on a number of different levels are just worth their weight in gold for sure. Yeah. And it, and it makes it, uh, ultimately this final stage of the process for an artist, right. And a producer, the people that spent months, years, maybe like bring it to fruition. It makes that last little lap and home stretch that much more pleasant. And you want that kind of momentum going out of the gate. You don't want someone to feel like, uh, we're kind of just, it's really feel like this last lap is just taking the wind out of our sails. And you know what I yeah, mean? Like, yeah, is the totally. record even good? Does it even matter? The band breaks up, <laughs> you know, the label doesn't get whatever. It's like, um, no, obviously, uh, that's not happening, but yeah, it's, and that's, that goes so far. And I, I know this too, even with just, um, things, things that you mentioned, like in that part, you know, that process with, Wonder Years Records, we have always been a very uh, album centric band an album focused band sending in mock sequences and things like that and making sure that we have our, you know, agreed upon kind of, you know, charting of how the, the songs will flow and then take cues from like, hey, this feels a little too long or this transition you wanted it to maybe heard it like that, but it's not really working. Let's maybe go back and redo this like intro. So it's more seamless or whatever, you know, um, and having someone that's willing to do that and willing to kind of go back and and put the time in to get that right. It really makes, especially when you play that record, if it's on vinyl, you know, and a lot of our, there are a lot of fans that love and the bands that they love the most, they listen to the records all the way through, you know what I mean? Um, And that is, uh, I think, you know, it's really interesting to be having this conversation now, too, as we obviously are like so deep in like the new like um, uh, the new fast track of a singles economy as far as so many people are concerned, you know, online. Uh, So, yes, like, sure, your job, you know, is much the same from a singles base, but it is that kind of greater art form, too, where you are able to step back and look at how to present a whole album in the same way that 
the person that does the cover art and the full illustration and the full, it's part of the full vision and all of those things matter um, and go a long way to presenting an artist as, you know, what they are and what their fans come to know and come to respect them for, you know, is that quite a, that quality control, which is kind of what you mentioned at the start of this. For sure. And I think being able to make whatever changes that I need to make on my end really easily, I mean, just being set up to do that, because I think that it kind of like shows when it's a when it, if it were a pain in the ass for me to go back and like add space between songs or reorder songs, it would take me longer to do it. You know, I, I think that inevitably it would somehow show that it was like, oh, OK, but now it like the way I have it set up and, you know, it took a little bit of extra time to figure this out. But I have it set up. So, hey, if you want to switch a song around, if you want to add space, it's like super, super quick and I can do it and it's not a problem. And, and if we have to experiment with a couple different things, um, it's it's easy to do that. And and that was one of the things that was really important for me too to be able to revise quickly, to try different things. You know, uh, sometimes I have, you know, artists that want to try something and then we don't use it. And that's not a big deal to me. It's like if we try a V2 and we're like, hey, I'm glad we tried this, but V1 was the way to go. I'm not like, oh, God, I had to just go back. I had to go, you know, I, I have it set up so that generally if I need to make a pretty small adjustment to a song or a sequencing adjustment, there's no real analog recall involved, even though all of my mastering always passes through an analog chain. I'm always doing processing in the analog domain. I kind of leave myself some room to make subtle adjustments and and especially make kind of level and sequence and arrangement and spacing adjustments without having to go back and do any of that. And I think a lot of a lot of mastering guys do that now just kind of out of being required to. But it's it's show I think it shows that you're very, I'm very receptive to those sort of things and very open to trying things out. And and, you know, when I get a request from uh, a when I get a request from an artist or a producer that's like, Hey, let's add a little bit more low end. And I'm, I'm like, well, there's a couple different ways we can do this. I'm like, I'm just going to do it a couple different ways and I'll send it to you. And, and because it's very hard to describe music as anybody in the music industry knows. So sometimes it's easier to just say, Hey, here's three different types of low end. Here's three different ways. This is a dynamic kind of low end expansion. Here's just like a, a digital, very clean EQ. Here's my tube EQ. Like which one sounds good to you? Maybe they all sound good and we just pick one, you know, or maybe one is exactly what you wanted in the other. And, you know, the, 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 the best and most direct and efficient and, and best quality kind of way to do that is to be able to, if you need to, do the extra little bit of work, you know, to get it right. Totally. Yeah. Just on this point of like the singles versus album, have you noticed your workflow change in that regard? with the industry leaning more into the singles mindset rather than the album mindset? Maybe a little bit, but it certainly hasn't been dramatic. And I don't know if that's because I generally exist kind of more in the indie music world, mm. which I love. Honestly, I always say I'd be happy to do indie records for the rest of my life. I, I don't need a, a wall full of platinum records. That's fine. You know, if I can stay busy working on cool music, it, it doesn't matter to me. You know, if a hundred people are enjoying it or a billion people, but in that world, not a ton. I, I find that it's kind of uh, seasonal and I actually haven't even really nailed down that pattern, but there are definitely times where it's like every, but all the records are coming out. Uh, there was like a time like post kind of COVID lockdown. It was like, you know, some months later it was like, here come all the records. <laughs> They're all coming out. You know, for a while it was like, here's all the live in studio albums. Everybody's doing this live in studio, live in studio. So there's a lot of that. And then it was uh, some singles and then like, here come the records and then there's singles. So I think that like kind of before the, summer touring season there tend to be a ton of albums um but are there less year over year i haven't really noticed i think that again the kind of sphere that i work in and exist in people still appreciate and want to make a full album totally you know which i love i love working on on, on complete albums I, I like working on singles too you know either way i'm happy to as long as i'm working on cool music yeah of whichever course. way the music industry goes i'm, I'm cool with it love it love yeah. it yeah cool. so you know in the spirit of talking about um you know a cohesive artist vision for a full album right those are all songs that got delivered to you and like i mentioned you know whether it be like with a wonder years record for example it's like we come to you and 
kind of have a predetermined idea a lot of times of how we think the sequence and everything could fit together and have crafted a lot of those songs as such. Now, what happens, and I, maybe you have an example for this, um, if you get a project that's a collection of songs that were maybe not all done at the same time, uh, I don't know, maybe like a soundtrack, and you're charged with mastering that kind of project, how's that end up being different? Oh, yeah, well, uh, let's see. It, it happens quite a bit where where albums are done kind of piecemeal, um, and, and I'm very... Um, very good about kind of keeping everything and organizing my projects. I'm, as I'm sure you've noticed, everything kind of has a number and all that stuff gets saved in our, in our kind of, you know, on our hard drive and our, all the project notes. And it's important for cases like that. So you can come back and I can pull everything up and, Hey, we did a song six months ago. Um, we're going to add a song to that project. So the, the, the project that I think you're talking about was the, the Bob's Burger soundtrack, which I was thrilled to do uh, recently. And, and one of the uh, really kind of awesome icing on the cake things about it was um, one of my buddies and longtime producers I've worked with, Alex Prieto. I don't know if you mm -hmm. know him, but he's a, a L.A. guy and he used to be a New York guy. And again, uh, maybe it's dudes who ride bikes, uh, but <laughs> another fellow mountain biker. And we, you know, he's been kind of doing like rock records and heavy records forever and then got the gig doing uh, Bob's and, and Central Perk. And uh, I was lucky enough to kind of land the mastering gig on the on the movie. Such a shift from the other stuff I get from him. Um, but so cool. And also so cool to do something like that, which is pretty new to me, but then also have like a bro in the mix. You know what I mean? So it was a little bit less intimidating. But yeah, that's a totally different thing because with Bob's, there were, I don't know if you guys have seen the movie, but there's a couple musical numbers in the movie. So I mastered the musical numbers kind of like they were songs, but at the same time, they're almost like Broadway style songs. And if you ever listen to like a Broadway soundtrack, the vocals are very prominent. The music yeah. is less of a, of, a, of a thing. I mean, it's there, but it's kind of a different style of mixing. So there needs to be a different style of mastering. So it's not going to be like slammed up against the wall. There's a different audience. People are listening for a different reason. So I took that into account. So so there's these musical numbers that I had mastered. And then sometime later, weeks or something, they came with the score and I mastered the score, which is literally exactly what's behind the movie. And it was so cool to go back and watch the movie like a month later and like know like where the string stabs were going to be. It's like I kind of knew what the plot of the movie was <laughs> before I saw the movie because yeah, I yeah, yeah. Heard the songs. And then when there was like a scary scene, like I knew when something was going to happen because I knew that like any minute now there's going to be this like violin trill and, and what is that going to be? And it was kind of cool to kind of see those two things put together, but very different process again for the, the score of the movie. And then sometime later they were like okay here's a here's another song we have one more song and we're gonna take this collection of those songs and then put them all on vinyl mm -hmm. together so we had to kind of cherry pick they selected them but i had to go back and take certain songs from the score certain songs from the musical numbers put them together and and even though they were kind of mastered very differently then kind of find some sort of a common thread between the two of them and then make it work for vinyl uh and it was definitely a challenge um but you know you just keep listening and keep turning knobs until it sounds good and uh once you get it sounding good then you know you gotta trust that it's good which really also then goes back and this is a whole other thing but being in a space that you trust monitoring wise because anytime you're kind of like a little unsure of yourself, you can just say, hey, look, when it sounds good, it's good. And if you know that when it sounds good in your space, that it is good, then that's just like such a confidence boost. And you always have that to kind of lean back on. Yeah, totally. Totally. Yeah. That, uh, that's a, it's a very nice thing to have. And it's a, a central tool that I feel like people um, sometimes uh, can look over <laughs> and uh, like the, the room itself. Dude, that's so cool. As far as like just getting into like the weeds of that project a little bit more, when you were mastering for vinyl, were you like going back to square one on the like soundtrack verse, like the cherry pick soundtrack 
songs and the cherry pick like musical numbers or were you kind of like making these two already mastered things just flow together ni- a bit nicer sure sure um kind of the latter because generally when i have the songs you know i'm i'm I try to go with the or start with the EQ'd versions of what I've done. So so often what I'll do is do you know master the songs but I'm not I'm not printing them with any sort of limiting on mm. them. They kind of come back into my DAW and then I'm doing some sort of digital processing which then finalizes with the limiting. So I can always go back and undo that but then still have my analog captures from my chain that has any compression and and um and any EQ, and then often I send the I do processing before I send the files out to my chain. So so there's like they're like seventy five percent mastered, and I use that kind of as a starting point. I have some headroom to go on. So I, I if I can, I start there, and then generally with the vinyl mastering, I kind of just keep in mind what uh, you know, limitations are of the medium of vinyl. And then also, uh, I was really lucky to spend some time at master disc and, um, my room was right across the hall from like one of the nicest record master cutting lathes in, in the country or the world maybe. And Scott Hull, who I think is probably one of the better, you know, cutters and then the, a, a number of other awesome engineers who would rent his room and cut masters there and i got to just like i would just go hang out i never actually cut myself um but i would hang out in that room when they were doing digital transfers to their master lacquers and kind of see what they hated yeah, yeah, yeah. what made them like curse at the computer in the lathe and what they loved and just kind of build an understanding for, you know, ultimately when I do a vinyl pre-master as I'll I'll call it is, you know, it gets sent to another engineer who's going to then cut that onto a lacquer and he's familiar with his particular lathe and the particular quirks or, you know, whatever. But I try to like take my knowledge of what that medium requires and, and can't handle and give them the best starting point, you know, where hopefully they just have to set the level and then just they, they can cut it. I'm sure that that's not the case almost ever, <laughs> but the closer I can get them to that, you know, totally. and I always like when I, when I get a message from, you know, I always put um, like a, my, you know, a little uh, suffix on all the files that I master. So every now and then I'll get a text or a, a uh, Instagram DM from an engineer who's cutting one of my uh, masters. And I'm always like, Oh, how was it? How was it? You know, what, what can be better? What, what sucked? Did you have to use a DS or all over the place? Was it too bright? Um, so when I hear that it's really good, I'm like, it makes me really happy. You know, <laughs> love that. What a great way to wrap it up too, is kind of like really taking your pro like post master and even going all the way through to the cutting, to the cutting floor, which is awesome, which is something Tom that we have not, I now realize even touched on, we might have to reach out to Scott or somebody else yeah. and capture that part of the process maybe next season. But Mike, that was a lovely explanation of, of how the, the, you know, those two kinds of projects can, can be really different for you. And, uh, really appreciate you sharing that with us. And of those course, are two, yeah. I mean, I, will obviously go listen to the soundtrack with an extra close ear now, um, not just for, um, you know, complete entertainment sake uh, on the Bob's <laughs> Burger end. And that weighs away record as well because I dig the band and we will be sure to like link to all of that stuff in the notes, um, of course, when it comes out. Where can any, anybody find you? We mentioned at the top of this, obviously, uh, you go under the banner of Rogue Planet Mastering. But uh, for anybody, engineers, producers, artists that want to check out your stuff and hear how good you are um where can they find you yeah i mean the the rogue planet mastering.com um i'm fairly active on my instagram i i I technically have a rogue planet mastering instagram but i just don't really use it anymore Um, i use my own um which i it's I mean, I don't know if I should say it or if it's, if you, it's for linking uh, at Collision of Doom, which is an inside joke, by the way. I feel like nobody's ever asked me this, but it's kind of a silly thing. Like, um, do you remember the uh, Legion of Doom? It was like the bad guys from the Superman mm-hmm. comic books. Oh, absolutely. I, I, yeah. There was the Justice League and the Legion of Doom. So one of my good college friends, his forever, his, uh, 
aim name and Instagram name, his, his last name is Drust, D-R-U-S-T. So it was Drustus League. And then I made mine Collision of Doom. It was like the, the opposite of that. This is long before I started working on metal records. So now I wonder if people are just like, oh, this is just some guy who does metal records all the time. And like, you manifested it. Like <laughs> you manifested yeah, it. Like, yeah, exactly. It's like the total opposite. It's like the kitschiest, you know, thing thing ever. I love that. Um, I love that. Yeah, yeah, I love that so much. And Instagram, for sure. Cool. Oh, yeah. very cool. Um, well, I love that. Yeah, my uh, my aim name has also followed me through to be my handle and everything else and really haunt me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, um, it, like, what, 20 plus years later. So, um, yeah, love to hear that. But it's done you well. Um, and, yes, I got the reference and checked it out and have, have been a fan of that handle for a while. So, uh, But awesome. I appreciate you uh, throwing that out there to anybody that might not catch how good it is. <laughs> um, and. Uh, and indeed, yeah. So um, go check out Mike. Follow that. And you also have some cool studio stuff coming up. And we're going to talk a bit more about this uh, on a, a gear segment episode, I think. But I want I want you to to kind of be able to just real quick um, tell everybody about the new studio um, and uh, how great it is, and the fact that uh, above all, it's pretty close to home. <laughs> um, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. So so um, we, we bought this house in February after a long uh, attempt at building a home, which was thwarted by COVID. Uh, but we got really lucky and found this beautiful, beautiful spot in uh, New Paltz, New York, which is kind of where we've lived for a, a long time. It's, uh, I don't know if you've ever spent any time in upstate New York, but it's like we just think it's the best time. It's, it's an awesome area, kind of an hour outside the city, right before you get into the middle of nowhere. It's like the edge of civilization, kind of in a way, mm -hmm. in, in a good way. But yeah, I put this um, studio in the house once we moved in and easily it's been the most thorough and best sounding studio that I've ever made. Um, my brother-in-law is a fantastic builder and he's built a few studios for me in the past. And when we moved into this house, we knew we were going to be here for a while. So I kind of didn't pull any punches and built the room that I always wanted. Uh, we went crazy with it. I mean, I could go on forever, but it sounds better than anything I've ever been in. And one of the really cool things about this studio is that it is actually, the, don't quite quote me on this because I still have to do the math, but I think it's about four times overpowered by solar. So there are solar power, there are solar panels on the roof of the studio. And I think that they generate three to four times more energy than the studio consumes, which was something that was kind of important to me. I mean, we live out in nature. We spend a lot of time outside. Um, you know, like I said, I'm a, a cyclist. My wife is big into running and hiking and we have two young daughters and it's important you know, that we uh, preserve, you know, every, the, the, the beauty of the world for our future generations, I guess. Um, so when I set the studio up and I leave this stuff on all the time, it was kind of all always in the back of my head, like, hey, I'm, I'm drawing some juice here. Uh, so I figured out exactly how much that was, or on average, how much that was and tried to make sure that I was able to, to offset it which I'm proud to have been able to do. So cool. Love that. Yeah, dude, that's phenomenal. And especially to, um, as engineers, producers, uh, just people that generally live in the like music making space, uh, whether it's a studio or your bedroom with the curtains drawn, I think a lot of, uh, artist producers, uh, definitely understand the plight of not getting outside enough um, and oh, not yeah, seeing that. Yeah. So I also love um, that uh, if you go follow Mike uh, at Collegian of Boom, you can see that, yes, you're you're out biking, you're out and about and um, enjoying um, the sunshine when it presents itself, which we should all do more of. And because we want that to continue uh, for future generations, I love that you have an initiative and, and thought about that because I think when we talk about gear and lots of like fun, shiny, like studio toys, all that stuff draws a ton of power and that power has to come from somewhere, um, yeah. which is a really important thing too, for sure. So I'm glad you brought that to light and what a, what a great way to have some forward thinking on that, dude. Yeah. I'm, I'm a, I'm a big work-life balance guy. And, and to your, to your point about the drawing the power, uh, 
I think new computers too, especially more and more and more these faster multi-core computers um, that are kind of required to do the type of, you know, crazy high definition video and audio editing. Again, I'm not a, an electrical engineer, but it seems like the the power supplies keep getting bigger and, and you know, a lot of this studio gear uh, is vintage, you know, so it's not necessarily the most energy efficient. It's not set up to be that way. It's set up to do nope. its job really, really well. Um, and and I and I I saw that the, that didn't seem to be something that was really paid attention to in the audio industry. Um, you know, n- not that I don't think the audio industry is probably nearly the biggest offender <laughs> out there. But if there's any difference that I could make and kind of you know set an example, so I think I, I told you one of the things that we're going to do starting uh, the first day of fall is that for every song I master, we're going to donate to planting a tree. Um, it's a relatively inexpensive thing to do, but it just seemed like it was something that was an easy way to, to just give back a little bit. One of the things I'm going to focus on in this kind of break that I'm taking is how I can incorporate even more of those kind of climate initiatives into my workflow. And there's just seemed to be things that you can do that you almost wouldn't even, they're so easy to do, you wouldn't even notice them. And with that minimal effort, you can make a, a, a difference. Um, so that's kind of what I'm shooting for. Love that, dude. That's great. That's wonderful, dude. I am excited. Um, I can't wait to help you plant some trees uh, and send and keep sending some more stuff your way. This was so fun, man. Uh, we've been a fan of your work. I love what you're doing. Keep doing it and keep enjoying uh, the process. Uh, and um and the and the uh the life that you have up there you got a great setup and a great area man so uh super happy for you and and thank you for making time because i know you got a lot on your plate coming up trying to you know put some time in uh or get some time away next month to bring some things together so uh, we really appreciate it oh man well thank you so much for having me this has been such a treat i love getting the you know, talk shop. And, and I feel like as I am asked questions, great questions and talk about my process and what I uh, have going on and what I plan to do and what I've done, it's a really great way to kind of like also reflect. It Mm -hmm. causes me to kind of rethink some things. And, and uh, I I think that doing this, going into taking a, a, some time off to kind of readjust some things was so, so great in a way that I didn't even expect, you know, an hour and a half ago, because now I'm like, okay, and now I've got some new, you know, yeah, new yeah. direction. I've kind of rehashed some of my past, you know, my origin story. So, like, where can I kind of shift from here? Dude, so, I love so that. thank you. You know, it's been a pleasure on multiple levels for sure. Ah, uh, that's awesome, man. Well, we're excited to watch you write the next chapter, dude, or the next phase of it. Um, but yes, uh, thank you again. We'll talk to you soon. Awesome. Thanks, man. So when a songwriter or a producer is making creative choices, I think they should always consider the genre and the intended audience of the project at hand. And I think this conversation spoke to why mastering is so crucial in presenting those carefully crafted choices. The transitions and balance from song to song on an album or playlist is what makes them speak together as a cohesive story. This is a fundamental part of how we experience music as listeners, and Mike dedicates his career to making those subtle adjustments that are responsible for shaping our subconscious feelings about what we hear. And ultimately, it is those adjustments that are curating the final word on how these songs are presented to us. As Mike mentioned, the art of mastering is a business that is heavily reliant on speed and volume of projects. So I I love the fact that he brought up how he tries to stay in touch with nature and daylight. This is not something that studio professionals are typically great at, myself included, but something that can really help rejuvenate your focus and keep your long-term productivity and quality of work steady. I love his recognition of that. So don't forget to go see some daylight. It's very easy for songwriters, producers to want to lock themselves in a windowless room and not come out until the job is done but I think taking some of those breaks can be really healthy for us in the long run. So as always, if you want more info on any of our guests or you're curious about ways that you can help us grow the show, all that info is in the show notes. And thanks again for taking the time to join us right here on The Record Process.